And now a review of one of Britain's greatest historians. Oh, hang on, I see a people on the wrong channel. But in any case, let's start this off. Hello again. Many of the most famous battles fought by the British Army were in the nature of set pieces where the... True to some extent. Let's see where he's going with this. The British Army and the one opposing it met in some piece of open country or farmland and then the two sides fought to see which was the stronger. Agincourt. Agincourt was not fought by the British Army because the British Army didn't exist at that point. More fantastic um, lack of research there. It was fought in 1415 and the British Army didn't exist. <sighs> it was such a battle, as was Waterloo. And Waterloo involved a large number of villages and small towns which got caught up in the fighting. Perhaps uh, Simon should go and check that. Yes, it was. It, it could be called a set-piece battle in some respects, but it also involved the use of mass artillery and many of the positions in the fighting engulf small villages and towns. You can go and check that if you if you want to say if I'm telling the truth or he's telling the truth. Civilians in their homes were usually unaffected by such... Complete rubbish. Uh, civilians in their homes are often raised to the ground in wars across many centuries. In theory, in the Middle Ages, there were actual rules of warfare which people were supposed to follow, imposed by the church and... Uh, for example, in the High Middle Ages, in reality, were they always followed? The answer is no. And often civilian towns got caught up in fighting and the siege warfare, and there was often destruction. It's complete rubbish, he, this. It's a very powerful picture of history, to say the least. Events. There were, of course, sieges which did involve civilians. Uh, well, then you've just contradicted yourself in, within... A, a, under a minute, Simon, there were sieges that did involve civilians. But often an entire war could be fought on plane, some way from people's homes. So, And then again, it might not be. There are plenty of examples of major sieges that, that were pretty horrific and horrible in, in European and Br British history. You've had to mention them because you can't ignore them. And by doing so, you basically undercut your own theme in, well, under a minute. <laughs> Battles were, of course, seen as late as the Second World War. Um, one thinks, for example, of El Alamein in 19... The Second World War, where, of course, civilians were not involved in any... Uh, the version in From an Alternate Earth where massive civilian casualties didn't occur. In '42, But by that time, war had more often than not become something which involved civilians directly. It had become something that involved civilians long, long, long before that especially by, via the mechanised nature of violence in World War I and events as far back as the US Civil War, which involved early use of what we'd see as mass killing via Gatling guns and more modern artillery and ironclads and so on. This is complete rubbish, this whole presentation so far. Okay. We remember the Blitz on London and the Siege of Leningrad. This is how most wars are being fought today. The Blitz on London, that was carried out by these blokes called, allied with the Third Reich called the Luftwaffe. Um, there seem to be some funny groups going around, funded alike, who seem to be Holocaust denials. You're going to be in a... They seem to, grant, seem to grant grants to people to write books, some of these organisations. You seem to be placed in a rather impossible position at, to... When you take grants from them and then oppose the Third Reich as a historical uh, entity, it puts you in a rather awkward spot. In and around areas where people are living in their homes. Inevitably, this makes for loss of life of non-combatants and collateral damage to their homes. Well, yes, generally, if you drop high and send explosives, on, uh, it, does, it doesn't do any uh, favours to the decor in people's homes. We've seen this in Ukraine, of course. It seems to be the rule these days rather than the exception. It's something that... Again, complete rubbish. There was mass carpet bombing of civilians in Vietnam that is reckoned to have killed um, well over a million people. There was mass slaughter of people long before World War II in other conflicts. 
This is a, a bizarre version of history that's been pat peddled here. Most of us find appalling, but is nevertheless common. Sometimes this is caused by armed forces which embed themselves in the civilian population, uh, staying in neighbouring houses and generally mingling. The same critique, I know where this is going to go. Let him go to where he's going, and then I'll offer my rejoinder. With them. This makes it very difficult for somebody wishing to fight them to do so without affecting civilians. The thumbnail to this video shows what this can lead to. It is not Gaza, nor is it the aftermath of Hiroshima. It is actually the French port of Le Havre. The German army held the town in 1944, and so three months after D-Day, when the British and Americans wished to advance, they were compelled to attack the German soldiers where they were, which was scattered throughout the city. Using a combination of high explosives and incendiaries dropped from the air, the Allies simply destroyed the entire town, leaving nothing but rubble and ashes. Yes, and the events that occurred there are controversial to this day, with people, proponents, saying it should have occurred and there was now the possibility of taking the town and people arguing against it. And remember, that was a town belonging to the country that had come to liberate. About 5,000 French people were killed, uh, civilians, by the way, killed during the Allied attacks on the Havre. The case is very similar to that of Isidin al Qassam, the military arm of Hamas in Gaza. And is it similar then to the Palmach, Haganah, or Ergen, all who were embedded within particular towns and societies early on in the fighting to have found Israel? If you use this criticism, it becomes a double edged sword which will strike back against you. You can't use it against the groups you're condemning unless you admit that it's got, it can also be used against you. And of course, Hezbollah in Lebanon. These are essentially armies which are based in civilian districts. Israel are fighting a war with both Hamas and Hezbollah. Perfectly true, and I have no, I have no great love of either of those two groups, particularly the, the former. However, what you're not pointing out is the former was tacitly ignored for many years and almost propped up by, by the regime in Israel, which saw it as a way to almost further its own interests by quashing more moderate voices. Secondly, as I pointed out earlier, you cannot possibly talk about groups being embedded within the civil structure involved in violence and not be met with a snort of derisive laughter for anyone who knows about, even a little bit about his role came to be. The Agana, Ergun, or... All could be described, if you wish to be un wish to, as terrorist groups by a modern point of view. I probably wouldn't use that term as I think it's simplistic, but they certainly model themselves on groups like the Irish Republican Army. And you've mentioned it yourself in the past and are well aware of it. So this is a very, very simplistic and one-sided take on history and lacks nuance. And that means that their attacks are going to cause a lot of damage to the infrastructure of the area where those groups are operating from, as well as civilian casualties. They are also causing a great deal to, of damage to themselves. The cost to the Israeli economy is immense, with it contracting more and more as this goes on. And with uh, uh, millions of Israelis going, hello, can we stop this, please? It's costing us billions and billions and billions of of, of dollars where the economy has contracted severely. I've not see, yet seen you mention that. It has been this way for 50 years to my certain knowledge. I lived in the Galil for a year and we could hear the artillery on the Lebanese border at night. You know, what does Lebanon? You could also argue that the invasion of Lebanon at the minute is unjustified and a war crime. And I would tend towards saying it that way. We've seen like um, a concept of basically might makes right. Now, of course, that could be argued to be pragmatic politics and the reality of the world. But realistically, Israel is creating a rod for its own back by constantly involving itself in endless conflicts. Eventually, it will stretch its forces ridiculously thin. 
you're seeing that basically it's become it's starting to edge towards becoming a prior state where other states are beginning to distance themselves from it. These days, it was Fatah, of course. They were mainly firing katushas uh, mounted on lorry. Katusha. Uh -huh. It's old Russian rockets dating from the Second World War. They would position them near a mosque. Or Actually, they're a bank of rush uh, rockets, not just one rocket. School and then far off a dozen of the things. When the Israelis worked out the direction from which the firing was coming, they would then fire back with their artillery, sometimes hitting the school or surrounding homes. It is an old game, and the way that it's being played now doesn't differ at all from the way it was being played half a century ago. Except for the fact that we asymmetric warfare involving drones, hacking, and other forms of technological advancement have moved along a hell of a long way in 50 years. There are things now used in warfare that were not even dreamed of except in the works of science fiction writers or people of that ilk when I was born. The use of hacking to down systems in a country or down parts of its infrastructure, dr unmanned drones, etc., for my own part, I detest war, but the truth is, people do get killed during wars. In the description... Of course they do, and not all wars are fought as set-piece battles in this, uh, in this strangely bizarre, simplistic history that's been presented here. But it's a bizarre history of the Napoleonic Wars being foisted off here. The Napoleonic Wars in Portugal, for example, involved guerrilla campaigns, quite horrible situations and destructions of towns at times. It's, this is a bizarre kind of history that's been foisted here. Absolutely bizarre and, and strange. To this video, I give a link to a piece of mine on this subject, which is on my Substack account. It gives more information about the destruction of Le Havre. If, if, the, uh, if the research is so great, great that it has the British army fighting at Agincourt, well, I think I'll pass.